there are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Some time back, I did a ponderously slow study of the book of Acts. I just spent time soaking basically on every verse and reading it slow and thinking about it. And as I began to progress through the book, something emerged to me. I saw or noticed every time that the church grew numerically or it grew in heart or grew in influence. And I felt like the Holy Spirit began to show me certain keys that caused the early church to grow. And I realized that these same keys will cause the church of God to grow in every generation. Growth in numbers, in heart and influence is not a coincidence. It happens on purpose. We're going to be talking about keys to a growing church. Why don't you open your Bible to the book of Acts, if you would. We'll be looking there shortly. And our, our theme on the weekends right now is the church he sees. Basically, exploring what God desires to see in his church. What God, by his spirit, through his people, is working to accomplish in his church. And as I was praying about it, knowing I was going to be speaking tonight, I felt very strongly the Lord impressed me that one of the things that he desires to see, his vision, if you would, for his church, is to see a growing church. A church that's going from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from strength to strength. God never imagined a stagnant or stationary church, but he sees and wants his church to be moving forward, increasing, developing, and expanding. And so I'm going to share with you tonight four things that I found in the book of Acts as I study the church throughout that book, four things that specifically brought growth and brought increase and expansion to God's family. But before we look at those four things, I would like to touch on some truths that I think are foundational to our study tonight. The first one is this. Growth can and should come in a number of areas. God's looking for growth in heart in influence, in faith, in knowledge, in love, in grace, and of course, in numbers. And frankly, the numbers are important because they represent people, and God loves people. So it's not just about numerical growth. God's plan for us as individual members of his church and as an assembly together is to increase in influence, to increase in love, to increase in good works, to increase in knowledge, and yes, to add precious souls to his family. And then secondly, growth for God's family, it is his will. Growth is his will both for our individual lives and for his church. Any theology that would thwart growth, I don't think comes from God. Things that don't grow, die. And God, frankly, is in to reaching lost people He's into us developing and maturing and growing as believers. So it is God's plan for all of his church, wherever that church might be found, wherever those members might be found. And then thirdly, and this is important, it's always a mistake to compare yourself with others. And I think we can be inspired and challenged by someone else or by the growth of another church, but the moment we begin to compare ourselves against them, it's not wise. 2 Corinthians 10 and 12 says this, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. It's not a wise thing to do. And frankly, growth is a relative thing. I mean, you take a country church as opposed to a, a church in the middle of a metropolitan area, the growth is going to be different. Or you perhaps take a church that 
you know, has been established in an area where the seeds of the gospel have been sown for decades, maybe even centuries. It's been bathed in prayer, bathed in sacrifice, as opposed to a, a church where the seeds of the gospel haven't been sown and where there hasn't been much prayer. One of them, it's a matter of entering into the labor of others, where one is a strictly pioneering work. And it's just unwise to compare the two. You know, even when it comes to individual spiritual growth, some of us have had to lose a whole lot more wrong thinking than other people. Some of us had a whole lot more emotional baggage that we were carrying around because of the circumstances and events of our life. And you know, I think sometimes from heaven's point of view, the people that we feel are really lagging behind, and by God's measure, they've actually made much more progress than the person we're ready to pin a medal on. So you just, you just can't judge by outward things, and it's never, ever wise to compare. And then just a forethought here. Ultimately, God is the one who makes his church grow. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, Psalm 127, 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. That's the only verse I have up in my office on the wall. Unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord, literally the word house is family, unless God builds the family, they labor in vain who build it. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And here's the fifth and final thought before we look at those, those four things in, in the book of Acts. We have been called to labor with God in this business of growth. Meaning if we're going to experience it, we must cooperate. It won't just happen. It doesn't just fall on us like ripe fruit out of a tree. Listen to these words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 9. I planted, Paul is watered, but God gave the increase. God made it grow. For we are God's fellow workers. So do you want to be a fellow worker with God in this business of growth? Anybody in besides me? All right, number one, look with me at Acts chapter six, if you would. The first thing that, that struck me that brought growth to his church, his family, was ministry. And it becomes self-evident what I'm talking about, ministry. Acts chapter six, verse one. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the result of them making that decision and following through with it, we look in verse 7, then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I see the apostles didn't get bogged down with administration. And it wasn't because, you know, to them this widow thing wasn't important. The widows were very, very important to them. But what they did is they delegated and left the solving of that problem to others. And then what they did, we didn't read in verse 5, they communicated with the whole congregation what had been set in place. And then they followed through with their main calling, which was prayer and the ministry of the word. They would continue to feed the flock the word of God and pray for God's sustaining hand and God's guiding hand upon the work. And the result is that the church grew mightily. And you know, I've been around the block a few times. 
I've uh, got a lot of friends in ministry, a lot of acquaintances. I've watched many scenarios play out in churches. And one of the things that I've seen many, many times as I've traveled across the, the states here and around the world is that the pastor, the leader, does everything. They do all the counseling, all of the visitation, all of the weddings, all of the funerals, all of the preaching, all of the problem solving. And as a result, they end up burned out with very, very little time left for prayer and for the study and ministry of the word. It just doesn't take that high of a priority. But we find with them, their first priority was continual prayer and the ministry of the word. And I think some leaders in, in God's family, they spend most of their time putting out fires. You know, like this, this issue with, with the widows. There's always problems, you know, in a, in a growing church. There's going to be. The Bible says where there's no oxen, the stall is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Meaning if you want the increase that the ox brings, you're going to have to be willing to get into the stall and deal with a lot of you-know-what. <laughs> and if you want your life to grow, and you want your church to grow, and you want to grow in your calling, guess what? You're going to have to deal with a lot of mm -hmm, uh, uh, problem-free pro problem life. I don't want any trials. I don't want any hassles. I don't want any problems. We'll just add, I don't want to grow. I don't want to, win, I don't want to increase. I want to stay right where I am, maybe go backwards a little bit. No, you have to deal with stuff. It just comes along with the turf. But, but some people, rather than delegate and let other people solve problems, they feel like they have to do it all. So they spend all of their time putting out fires. You know, there's a problem here. Somebody got offended here. Somebody, it was too loud. Oh, you know, the air conditioning was this way. Oh, somebody else, you know, the, somebody made a politically incorrect statement. Someone was insensitive and did this. And this person, you know, kind of, they felt like they were treated this way. And so they're just running around dealing with everything. And when that happens, why don't you listen to me? The devil, instead of the Holy Spirit, ends up leading the ministry. You know why? You know how? All the devil has to do then is start fires. And then the devil ends up being the one to lead the ministry rather than God. I, uh, this is back in the BC days. I uh, used to live a bit of a wild life and I was planning to meet some friends out at Joshua Tree National Park. And our plan was we're going to meet out there in the morning. We're all going to take LSD and then just walk around the desert. Great way to spend a day. Well, I got hung up and didn't get out there till the afternoon. So they went ahead and fulfilled the agenda. Everybody dropped acid and they went out in the desert. They're having a good time until one of them got the bright idea. And this is middle of summer, 115 degrees out. One of them shoots a flare gun off. And they all thought it was great, like, whoa. Until it hit, poof, this bush in the middle of the national park poof, catches on fire. And they go, oh, no. And they run over. And they're, they're trying to put it out. They're throwing desert sand and you know, rocks and dust on it. And, and their, their fingernails got, got torn away. And poof, another bush catches fire. They run over there. They're throwing dirt on that. They have no water. And then poof, another bush burst into flame for three hours. They're running from bush to bush to bush, <laughs> putting out fire so the national park doesn't burn down. So I get there in the afternoon. I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm in. You know, let's go party. And I walk in there in this little trailer. And the three of them, they're sitting on a couch. Their faces are, are black from soot. Their hair is burnt, true, their teeth were black from all the soot. They'd inhaled a bunch of smoke, their fingernails are gone, the ends of their fingers are bleeding. And I, I go, guys, what happened? And they, they couldn't even talk. The three of them were the picture of absolute 
exhaustion. And as I think back on that picture of my three friends sitting on the couch, it reminds me of so many pastors and leaders I have known. Because they spend all their time and all their energy putting out fires. And so the devil just lights another fire, lights another fire, lights another fire. And they're always putting out fires and they get almost no time for prayer and the ministry of the word. Friend, it is so, so important. It's important if the church is going to grow numerically, but it's important as well if the church is going to grow spiritually. Because it's as we feed upon the word, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. God wants us to grow. And so it's important that I or whoever standing up here has had time with God. So you're not just getting, you know, like Sunday dinner, which basically is, you know, nothing but leftovers and too long away from the fire. You'll get that eventually. That was actually a cool little thing I just said. (laughs) So we must give time to ministry. And then number two, number two is miracles. First, ministry. Secondly, miracles. Look in Acts chapter 4, if you would. The disciples have been threatened. In fact, the the scripture says that they were threatened severely and then threatened further not to preach or teach at all or even speak to anyone in the name of Jesus. So they gather together with all of the disciples and they begin to pray. And let's jump into their prayer. Verse 29, they said, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now let's look at how God answered that prayer. Chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes. Everyone say multitudes multitudes of both men and women. They got together and they prayed, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal by the name of your son, Jesus. And then we read, as it takes place, it says, through their hands, miracles and signs and healings were done. They prayed that the Lord would stretch out his hand, but the Bible says the healing took place through their hands. My friend, we are his hands. We are his feet. We are his voice in many respects. And we need to lay hands on the sick. We need to obey the great commission and preach the gospel to every creature, cast out demons and lay hands on the sick as Jesus told us in Mark chapter 16. And the result of these miracles that took place, the church multiplied. Look with me in Acts chapter 8. Philip has gone down to the city of Samaria. And this is just a few of many examples. Acts 8 verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. As it goes on, people were baptized in the name of Jesus. The city is burning with revival fires. Many, many converted to Christ. But the catalyst that caused it to happen was the miraculous. Acts chapter 9. Look with me if you would. Verse 32. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. 
Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, the Christ, heals you. Arise, make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt, dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, Lydda was a town that mostly had a Jewish population, but Sharon was an entire district that had many, many towns in it. All who dwelt, dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw the healing of this one man, and the result, they turned to the Lord. Friends, cities shaken by one miracle. Look a little further in the chapter. A woman named Tabitha has also called Dorcas, has died. Verse 40, Acts 9. But Peter put them all out, knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when, she had called, when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. Uh, these are just a few examples. And my friend, the gospel still must be preached, but we find the miraculous serving as a catalyst to bring many, many people to Christ. You know, as a young Christian, very young Christian, this is 40 years ago, I uh, went down to Mexico, and it was actually a region in Baja, California, where I used to go down and drink myself into oblivion. This is the same area, literally, I had in the past been passed out on the streets, drunk, and now I was down there preaching the gospel. And I was involved in a, a crusade that was there. I wasn't preaching. I, I did a little bit of music. And there was thousands of people in this crusade. It was in a little colonia called Piedras Negras above Ensenada. And um, they gave me the job one day. I had my old 63 microbus. They were going to show one night the movie A Thief in the Night. And they had it all dubbed over into Spanish. And so I went on all the dirt roads back in all the little villages with a bullhorn hanging out of my car, inviting all the people in the villages to come see a thief in the night that's going to be on that night. So I still remember I'm driving around going, Un ladrón en la noche. Esta película tiene un impacto en su vida. And so I'm going and people are coming out. And this lady comes and stops, stands on the little dirt road in front of my van and she won't let me by. So I, I put it down, I had a couple people in the van with me, said, you know, what's going on? And she said, I need you to pray for me. She said, every night when the sun goes down, my family locks me in the cellar because I lose my mind every night when the sun disappears over the horizon. She says, I've taken knives and tried to kill my children. I, and, and I'm only normal again when the sun comes up in the morning. We, I said, what happened? She said, but my... My aunt, she's a bruja, she's a witch, and she cast a spell on me. And I've been this way for years. Every night, I have to be locked in the cellar, and I need you to pray for me. She was absolutely desperate. We went into her little home, and we laid hands on her, took authority over the devil. Jesus gives all believers authority over the devil. He said, in my name, you'll cast out demons. And so we did. We took authority over the devil, broke its power, got back in the little microbus, and, you know, off we go with a bullhorn. It was the following night. She's at the crusade. The following night, she's at the crusade with all of her children. She'd been set free. Her right mind came back into her. And then she got saved. And her children got saved. Members of her family got saved because of the miracle that they saw happen. Now, the next night, you couldn't get a seat. The entire little church was packed. The compound was packed. People were fighting to look in the windows. They're fighting to stand like five or six people back from the back doors to try and get in. And there was a massive amount of people that came to Christ in that town of Maniadero 40 years ago because of the healing of this one woman. And the thing is, my friend, we need to contend for the supernatural. Somebody says, why doesn't God do it? The supernatural, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they don't work by maturity, they work by desire. God sends them 
God initiates them in response to our desire. You read 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit included there, the gifts of healings, the working of miracles. It says desire the gifts. Twice, it says earnestly desire the gifts. It says be zealous for spiritual gifts. It goes on and uses other language. It says seek to excel in the gifts of the Spirit. They work when we desire them. And if we'll begin to pray, just like they did in the book of Acts, I mean literally have some bold public prayer and say, God, stretch out your hand to heal. We need the supernatural. We need your spirit to work. Friend, God hasn't changed. God will meet us. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. Bayless will continue with part two of his message next week. You know, the Holy Spirit does carry a power. He has a presence, he carries a power, and he is a person. And he wants to reveal himself to the church in every generation. And friend, we've been talking about the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit as it connects to the church growing. You know, multitudes followed Christ because they saw and they heard about the miracles which he did. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now the Holy Spirit, he comes in response to our earnest prayers. And when his power is, is outworked, it's both inward and outward. Inward in the fact that when we preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit's power convicts hearts and lets them know that the message they are hearing is true. And he also works outwardly in that there can be healings and signs and wonders. Jesus said believers are to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Every believer is responsible for that. I think we need to pray that the Lord would stretch out his hand to heal in our generation, in our church, in our neighborhood, and see what the Holy Spirit will do. Hi there. I've written a little booklet about the cross, something I believe can benefit every believer. We're looking at whether it's a reason for offense or if it's actually God's loving open door to a lost and hurting world. And along with that, I preached several messages in our church recently. These can help equip you to confidently share your faith with the lost. If you're serious about sharing your faith with others, contact us today to receive the Cross Bundle. This booklet and two message series will equip you to confidently talk about the most important decision you made in your life and the joy you found in Jesus. Learn how you can engage the lost so they can cross over from death to life. Request your cross bundle today when you use the contact information on the screen. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.